So I'm going to talk to you today about um, heart failure and palliative care. And as I said at the beginning, for those that came in late, my name is Dr. Ros Marvin and I'm a consultant in palliative medicine at Garden House Hospice. Um, and I'm just going to quickly ask my education people because I'm supposed to have presenter view and I don't. So give me one second. Um, just... <laughs> I can hear someone coming. Hello, see, um, you said that I would be able to have right. present to you. I did that. Whoops. I'm not sure you did that because I don't know why it's saying that. Lovely. Thank you so much. I have a team of angels behind me. <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why these patients need palliative care. And if you manage to catch the beginning of Mary's talk, for those of you who are a little bit late, um, the reason we need palliative care is because even with the amazing advancements in medication that we have nowadays, there is still roughly a 10% in-hospital mortality rate for patients admitted with heart failure. And of course, there is a 30% mortality rate for patients within a year of an admission with acute heart failure. So despite effective treatments, heart failure remains a terminal condition with high mortality and morbidity. Patients experience repeated hospital admissions and A&E attendance and death in hospital are experienced by many. So this slide is a sh slide shows the survival of patients with a new diagnosis of heart failure. Um, and actually the one year survival of these patients is less than that than patients that are diagnosed with colon cancer. There is a high mortality after the initial diagnosis. Um, and although you might expect that these patients experience a sudden death, um, most patients experience a more progressive death from heart failure rather than acute sudden death. So actually we have a little bit of time to implement palliative care before they die. Um, so this was 396 um, heart failure patients who are prospectively identified um, and it showed that um, in 52% there was progressive heart failure and death and there was a sudden death in only 22% with other deaths um, making up the remaining numbers. And of course, we've all seen patients with heart failure. We know that the clinical picture um, of a patient with heart failure is someone with either peripheral or um, pulmonary edema or both. Um, they tend to be short of breath and fatigued. But as this picture shows, there is quite a high number of other symptoms associated with heart failure. Um, and so we need to think about the patient as a whole and treat all their symptoms. So this slide shows um, the percentage of patients or the prevalence of symptoms within patients. And this is why they need palliative care, I believe. So up to 70% have a lack of energy, up to 65% experience breathlessness, and over half of them feel drowsy. But then we've got other symptoms. We've got dry mouth, we've got numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, difficulty sleeping. A high proportion of them are spending a lot of time worrying. Them, worrying. And of course, as Mary alluded to there's the cough either from the treatment with the ACE inhibitors or just from heart failure itself. Um, you can see here that up to 43% of people feel sad and a really high number up to 52% of heart failure patients feel pain associated with their condition and then there's change in taste and weight loss. These are palliative care bread and butter symptoms and that's why I think we should really get involved as early as, as we can. So the need for palliative care is partly because in comparison to advanced cancer, there is less understanding. So these patients have reduced understanding, including the stage of the disease in comparison to cancer patients. And surveys have also shown that they have less involvement in clinical decisions, especially towards the end of their life, um, when perhaps treatment options um, from cardiology have run out. Um, and they also have less access to supportive and palliative care in comparison to uh, cancer patients who are maybe more traditionally signposted towards palliative care. And I'd like us to think a little bit about how the patient feels when they have heart failure. And this is a quote from a qualitative exploration of patients' knowledge and experiences with heart failure. Um, and the patient here said, when you have heart failure, you always worry that the next breath is your last one. That's something you never know. 
to just take a moment and think how would that feel you know if we're healthy individuals we take our lungs for granted we don't think about our next breath until i say something like we don't think about our next breath and then of course we're all thinking about our next breath but it comes naturally to us doesn't it until you have a condition such as heart failure when suddenly that awareness of your breathing can really take hold so I wanted to talk a bit about how we how do we know that our heart failure patients might be becoming palliative and actually this is a definition from the general medical council and it's a definition of end-of-life care so end-of-life care means people who are approaching the end of life um, who are likely to die within the next 12 months so this includes people whose death is imminent within a few hours or days, but it also includes those with advanced progressive incurable conditions, those with frailty and coexisting conditions that mean that they're expected to die within the next year, and also existing conditions where they might be at risk of dying from a sudden acute crisis in their condition. So for example, a sudden myocardial infarct or exacerbation of heart failure or of course life-threatening acute conditions caused by sudden catastrophic events. So the definition of end of life care is broad um, and you may have heard of the surprise question uh, where we ask um, would I be surprised if this patient were to die in the next six months or the next year and if the answer to that question is no then we might want to consider referral to palliative care. So the gold standard framework is a, a system for GP surgeries to place their patients on a list if they're thought to be in the last year of life and those patients are categorized depending on how short their prognosis is thought to be so um, it's red amber green um, so it's roughly sort of days weeks months um, so how do we know that they might be suitable for putting on the gold standards framework and the GSF has um, specific clinical indicators for heart disease so that would be at least two of the indicators below so out of chronic heart fan, um, chronic heart failure New York Heart Association stage three or four so these are patients who are short of breath on minimal exertion or if a patient is thought to be in the last year of life for the surprise question or if the patient is having repeated hospital admissions with heart failure symptoms or if they have difficult physical so that could include anything from that list I showed you or psychological symptoms despite optimal tolerated therapy so all these patients could be referred to palliative care and the GSF indicators also include um, specific um, mentions for frailty so individuals who present with multiple comorbidities and have significant impairment in day-to-day -day living so they might have a deteriorating functional score such as a performance status or they might have a combination of um, symptoms such as weakness slow walking speed significant weight loss exhaustion low physical activity or depression so this is the sort of patient who might benefit from a palliative care referral as well now if we look at the patient trajectory from being first diagnosed with heart failure you'll see on the uh, left hand axis, axis we've got physical function so at the top being excellent and at the bottom being death and then along the bottom here we've got time and the number one is indicating the diagnosis so when the patient is diagnosed with heart failure and often they're diagnosed um, acutely unwell and um, their physical functioning is poor and then with optimal medical therapy as Mary's described their physical function will improve following diagnosis as their treatment improves their condition and you would hope then that the patient has a period of time where their functional level is stable and the reason there's a gap in this is because of course we can't say exactly how long that period of time will be and then they reach a stage where they begin to have dips in their physical function despite the optimal medical therapy and they might require um, repeated hospital um, uh, admissions for diuretics etc and then at some point they might reach point number four and at point number four they might be eligible for um, a really clever cardiology treatment such as a ventricular assist device or even a transplant um, 
or sort of cardiac resynchronization device, something like that. And then their function might go from being really quite poor to back to where they were soon after diagnosis again. And then the episodes might repeat. And then when you reach number five, that's when despite optimal medical therapy, the patient's physical function has deteriorated and eventually they will die. Um, but you can also see during this sort of long-winded trajectory with peaks and troughs that there are these dotted arrows going downwards and these indicate sudden cardiac death, which although I know it um, affects a smaller proportion of patients than the gradual death that we've been talking about, it still could happen to these patients. They might get an arrhythmia that's not survivable um, or some kind of infarct event or even a death from another cause. Um, but that means that they weren't expected to die the next day, but suddenly by the next day they had died. Um, and so this is another reason why we might want to refer to palliative care. It's because the patients who might experience sudden death, um, they ne wouldn't necessarily have warning of that event, but if we could tell them at least a little bit that they are at risk of a deterioration in their health, it might give them the chance, for example, to say goodbye to their loved ones, put plans in place to look after their loved ones after they've gone. It might allow them to say, I forgive you to someone that they haven't um, had contact with for a while, or it might allow them to say, forgive me if they feel they've done wrong somehow, um, or it might allow them to say, sorry, um, or I love you. So all these things are only conversations that patients can have if they're aware that their time on earth might be shorter than they first thought. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to think about this. So there are some poor prognostic signs for patients with heart failure that might indicate their time is shorter. Uh, advanced age, obviously, and refractory symptoms despite optimal therapy. So they're still breathless, they're still fatigued despite being on the highest tolerated doses of the medications. If they have more than two hospital admissions with a decompensation in their heart failure within a six month period, that's a very poor prognostic sign. Uh, so is being dependent um, for more than three activities of daily living. So they need help with washing, with dressing, with preparing meals. That's a poor prognostic sign. Uh, if they have cardiac cachexia, in other words, they're losing weight and there isn't really a cause, but they're just sort of gradually not able to maintain their weight. And then if some blood results as well. If they have resistant hyponatremia, so low sodium, or a serum albumin of less than 25, those are both poor prognostic signs. And if patients have an implantable cardiac defibrillator, um, which kicks in and gives them, a, gives them an electric shock if their heart goes into a funny rhythm, experiencing multiple shocks, so the heart's gone into a rhythm that the device corrects with an electric shock, um, it still means they're alive because the shock has kicked in and corrected the arrhythmia, but it's a poor prognostic sign. And of course, comorbidities such as a terminal cancer, that's not a good sign either. So again, how do we know they're palliative? Another way of looking at it is that if a patient has been in hospital and they're about to be discharged or they've recently been discharged into your care, you can ask them, what problems and concerns does this patient have? And you can also ask, is there a reason why I should not start thinking about referral to supportive and palliative care? And the problem orientated approach allows a patient to have access to the appropriate services when needed, rather than waiting because we're not at a particular stage just yet. And the focus should always be on the needs of the individual patient, which is why we ask them what their problems and concerns are. Traditionally, of course, we had patients who were being seen by cardiology and they reached the end of the line with treatment options and then they would be hopefully handed over to palliative care and we would um, pick up the pieces and attempt to um, support them to the end of their life. But now um, we're working hopefully much more closely with our cardi cardiology colleagues. And I know we receive a lot of referrals from Mary and her heart failure team at the Lister. And so the idea is that heart failure management should continue um, as palliative care gradually becomes more and more a mainstay of, of their support. Um, and there's even a, a more up-to-date version of this where heart failure management continues, but also palliative care 
um, sort of comes in in an episodic way. So for example, they might come in after a recent hospital admission and say, let's do some advanced care planning. And then that gets done and the patient has plans in place and palliative care steps back for a while. And then they might come back again when a patient has refractory um, breathlessness, for example, and they might support them with the breathlessness. Um, or they might suggest that the patient attends day services for one of our um, fatigue and breathlessness courses that we run. Um, so it's very much a collaboration between the two teams. Um, this is our referral pathway for anyone who's local and is curious about how heart failure patients get referred. Um, but if the patient is in hospital, it can come via the hospital palliative care team and they can refer to the appropriate hospice. Um, or if it's in the community and the patient's leaving hospital, then they can be referred to our community CNSs or day services. Um, but the pathways are out there. So one of the questions to Mary was about um, stopping treatment when a patient is, has become palliative. Now, this is obviously not about stopping patient uh, treatment. This is about how when a patient is diagnosed, as Mary has really clearly described, there are clear guidelines about what to start and when. However, there are no nice guidelines about what to stop and when in these patients. Um, so for, for a time I was working very closely with the heart failure clinic and was seeing patients in a simultaneous clinic with them. Um, and these patients rattle. Um, they have all these drugs. Um, so you can see they've got the ACE inhibitor, the angiotensin receptor blockers. You've got the beta blockers. You've got the digoxin hydranzoline nitrates. You've got loop diuretics. You've got the MRAs and you've got the thiazide diuretics. This is actually taken from a heart function clinic that Mary runs. Um, and it's a kind of tool so that the heart failure nurses can really quickly document what a patient is on. The reason they need a tool is because there are so many effective heart failure medications these days. And you can see at the bottom is a box for all their other medications. So if the patient has COPD or diabetes, you can see that they're going to be on masses of polypharmacy. But how do we know what to stop and when if a patient is in the last few days, weeks, months of life? So as Mary has um, described, a lot of these medications are started because they have um, benefits in terms of mortality. So patients take these medications and they live longer, happier, healthier lives as a result. And this, the medications on the screen that are in red also reduce the patient's symptoms. Um, so there are very few medications here that don't have a symptomatic benefit for patients, um, but all the red ones will improve their quality of life as well as their quantity of life. But when a patient has really advanced heart failure, we might consider stopping the medications that are crossed out here. So it may no, no longer be appropriate to give them an anticoagulant. For example, if they're at high risk of falling, we don't want to cause them to bang their heads and have a bleed. Um, we're not so worried about having a statin if their 10-year risk of um, atherosclerosis um, is irrelevant because they're only going to live a few more weeks or months. And the same with amiodarone and digoxin, these, these medications have side effects, you can get toxic um, if the renal function is reducing, for example. So these were ones to consider if the patient is struggling either with the tablet burden um, or with side effects, but keep the rest going. And then in the last days of life, I would consider stopping a few more. So maybe the, the digoxin, hydralazine, hydralazine, the spironolactone, et cetera. Um, but what I'd also encourage is to continue the rest of the medications. So the triple therapy of the ACE inhibitor, the beta blocker, and the, spiral, and the diuretic, for example, if it's um, improving symptoms, you can continue even in the last days of life, as long as the patient is able to swallow. So just to go back to that, obviously, if the patient isn't able to swallow, um, then we might be looking at other therapies. And I'm going to talk about um, subcutaneous furosemide um, a little bit later on. 
Um, Mary's touched on renal failure and I'll talk about it a little bit as well. Worsening renal fa function is a poor prognostic sign in acute decompensation of heart failure. Um, but actually patients with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, um, these drugs cause a greater improvement in morbidity and mortality in those whose renal function is deteriorating than those whose renal function is stable. So as Mary said, reduce and review and consider stopping, but maybe restarting again. Um, and actually, conversely, renal function may improve with better diuresis. Um, so it may be that if we offload the, them from their edema, uh, their renal function may improve because of inc improved kidney perfusion. Um, symptomatic hypertension was one of the things that came up in your questions. Um, and so the things we would try in patients who are still on heart failure medications, but are finding that they're dizzy on standing, um, we might suggest moving their dose to the evening. It may not be so effective, but it might um, allow them to keep taking their medications um, because, of course, you're less likely to fall over with dizziness if you're already in bed asleep. And obviously ensure that the patient is not dehydrated. We don't want to dry them out to a crisp. Um, or cause overload, but we don't, you know, again, we just don't want to make the patient really thirsty and dehydrated. Um, and if there's no improvement with a bit of rehydration and nocturnal dosing, then we could consider reducing the nitrate if the angina that they may have is stable, or if angina is a big problem, reduce the ACE inhibitor or ARB in preference to the beta blocker or nitrate. And if they have atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, then it might be a question of reducing the ACE or the ARB rather than the beta blocker. So it's very patient orientated. And I'm, I'm sure Mary's team of heart function nurses is very happy to advise. So just to summarize the rationalization of the medication, keep the triple therapy drugs going as long as tolerated on the maximum tolerated dose. Um, of course, it can be limited by hypertension, bradycardia or renal dysfunction. Tailor it to the individual as tolerance may vary, um, but as I said, heart failure treatment generally benefits survival and quality of life. So unlike with our cancer patients who might be on many medications and we tend to just go around and crossing them all off when they're approaching the end of their life, um, heart failure patients, we're much more likely to keep them going. I'm just going to check you can hear me. Okay, we're going to go. So we're going to talk a little bit about symptom control in these patients. So as I showed you earlier on, there's a huge number of symptoms that these heart failure patients suffer from. Um, and the cornerstone of optimal symptom management is of course the optimum tolerated medical therapy. So as I said, even when dying, um, we'd want to um, give diuretics and nitrates if they've got edema or angina. Obviously, heart failure patients generally do have comorbidities um, just by the nature of the fact that they tend to be more elderly and um, less healthy than the rest of the population. So we want to make sure that their other comorbidities, so their COPD or diabetes or whatever else, are optimally managed. Um, but then there is palliative management of symptoms, um, which where we think less about the underlying cause of the symptoms, but more about how we can make them feel better. So this would be a holistic assessment, and we would consider referring to other services such as physio, OT, so we have a physio and an OT at the hospice, um, and we also have a social worker. So if they've got spiritual issues or um, psychological issues, or if they have financial issues, we have the social worker and we have a family support team to help. Um, sorry, it's just stopped moving along. There we go. So let's talk about breathlessness, um, because of course, this is a really key symptom for our heart failure patients. We want to optimally treat the heart failure. I know I keep talking about that, but it is important. We also want to treat comorbidities, including anxiety. We can use non-pharmacological management, such as exercise and rehabilitation that Mary talked about, which decreases hospitalizations and improves quality of life. We can also use therapies such as mindfulness, which has been shown to improve breathlessness and improve anxiety and depression in these patients. And we can all recommend things like the apps, the Headspace app or the Calm app, um, so that patients can really self-manage their symptoms of anxiety. And then we'll come on to opioids. 
So opioids for bre breathlessness are useful because they reduce the chemoreceptor hypersensitivity. A little bit like they do in pain, um, they allow the receptors to um, be uh, desensitized um, and it reduces that feeling of air hunger and chest tightness that so many of our patients experience. Um, opioids can also improve abnormal ventilatory patterns found in heart failure. So the sort of dysfunctional breathing where they might be breathing very shallow, the sort of puffed up breathing where they're not really shifting much air um, or breathing that just isn't really smooth and regular. Um, and it also improves the experience of episodes of breathlessness as well, um, either due to exertion or just due to a sudden onset of feelings of panic and breathlessness. And the evidence is there for both oral and parenteral opioids, although it's not really there for opioid patches, but certainly we can use um, low-dose oromorph or oxycodone, or we can put drugs into a syringe driver. Uh, initially, we'd recommend low-dose oral morphine, so 2.5 milligrams as required. And then we would gradually titrate up to uh, twice daily modified release dosing. And if we are starting our patients on opioids, we know that 90% of them will become constipated. So it's best to give them a regular laxative before that issue occurs. And there's nothing like um, being breathless on, a, on the toilet for a poor patient. Um, so we really want to avoid constipation. Um, so this is a study um, done in 2011 um, showing that once daily opioids for chronic shortness of breath um, were effective, they had I don't remember how many patients, I think it was maybe a few hundred, they used low dose um, modified release morphine. So between 10 and 30 milligrams of um, modified release morphine over 24 hours. And the study showed that this was both well tolerated and effective. So there was a 62% response rate and more than 90% of those patients who responded to the opioids did so um, within a 20 milligram over 24 hour dose. So 10 milligrams twice a day, for example, of MST. Um, if started on modified release opioids, as I said, you would start with PRN, fast release or a morph, um, before going on to modified release. And ideally, you would only titrate weekly. And that's because the patients feel the benefit of an increase within 24 hours. But that benefit continues to increase over the following few days as well. So I wouldn't put up the dose until you've given that dose for time to the first dose of time to stabilize. And in this study, they found no episodes of respiratory depression or hospitalization due to opioids. I know a lot of um, my hospital colleagues in respiratory, for example, are wary of giving opioids to breathlessness patients um, because they feel there may be a risk of respiratory depression. But if you start low and titrate it gradually and keep an eye on the patient's response, um, these are safe medications. And this is a systematic review of the use of opioids for breathlessness in both heart failure and COPD. And you can see that um, almost all the, the little dots there uh, are on the side of the opioid being better than a placebo. And if you remember that even if there isn't a very significant difference in breathlessness in terms of the score out of 10, you might make the difference with an opioid of a patient being too breathless to make their own cup of tea to suddenly having enough puff to be able to go and put the kettle on themselves in case, instead of being dependent on other people. So even a small incremental incre improvement in breathlessness can be significant for a patient. Benzodiazepines on, other, on the other hand, um, have much less evidence of efficacy for the relief of breathlessness in advanced malignant and non-malignant disease, as this study shows. Um, so it looked at the effectiveness of benzodiazepines in advanced cancer and non-cancer diagnoses, and the meta-analysis showed no beneficial effect on breathlessness. However, there was a non-significant trend, so it's sometimes worth trying if a patient isn't really able to see an improvement with opioids. We have to be very cautious because, um, of course, benzos can cause memory loss, they can increase falls risk, and they can cause addiction in chronic use. Um, the point where we would consider using a benzodiazepine um, is when there is a significant element of anxiety and panic in their breathlessness episodes. Um, so that actually you want to make them calmer, um, which will then feed into the breathing cycle and make them less breathless. 
is they have anxiety, depression, or panic attacks as a really high up feature of their episodes of breathlessness, it's always helpful to try the non-pharmacological um, mechanisms such as breathing control and relaxation techniques. If anxiety is a constant feature, then they can be treated with an SSRI, and then it's teleprim has a good evidence base for safety in heart failure. However, if, as I say, they have these episodes that, are, that have a significant element of panic and anxiety feeding into the breathlessness, then we would maybe recommend sublingual PRN lorazepam just for the use during an episode. So moving on to using oxygen for breathlessness. There's no evidence that oxygen helps breathlessness more than a placebo if the patient has normal oxygen saturations. And you'd be surprised that even during exercise, chronic heart failure patients are usually not hypoxemic. So normally their oxygen saturations remain in the normal range, even when they're feeling puffed out with exercise. Oxygen may be beneficial if they have a comorbidity such as COPD and their oxygen saturations are low. We also have to factor in the cost and practicality of ambulatory oxygen and the fact that patients can become psychologically dependent on knowing that their oxygen is there and they might die without it. And of course, if there's a supply issue, um, they may panic or they might feel sort of chained to the house if it's difficult to take oxygen out and about with them. So really, we want to be careful with, with using oxygen for these patients. Now, as you saw from the list of symptoms, many heart failure patients suffer really badly with fatigue. And there are some reversible factors that we should consider when seeing these patients. So for example, if they are overdiuresed or hypokalemic, we might want to review their diuretics. Beta blockers are well known for causing tiredness. Um, so it might be worth just reassuring patients that the beta blocker may be the cause, or it might be worth reducing the dose slightly. A lot of these patients with their comorbidities also have sleep disorders. So if they're obese, they're at far higher risk of having orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, sleep apnea, um, and it may be worth referring for sleep studies and consideration of a CPAP machine at night. Obviously, patients are at high risk of developing depression, as any chronic disease patient is. And if we treat that, we might find that the patient develops more energy. And we should also be thinking about looking for anemia because, of course, that can be reversible with iron infusions or transfusion or simple or replacement. Um, and then, again, as Maria says, exercise um, deconditioning is a really big cause of fatigue. So a patient feels breathless, they do less exercise, their muscles atrophy, and then they can only do less exercise because they're not strong enough anymore and it becomes a vicious cycle. And again, that's another reason to either refer for the exercise services for the heart failure patients or the ones that we can offer here at the hospice in our day services. And even during lockdown, we've been doing seated exercise classes. Uh, we've been doing physiotherapy reviews over Zoom. Um, and now that lockdown is easing, we are seeing patients back in our gym. I'm pointing over there because it's, it's over there. And as you saw from the, the list of symptoms, pain can be a big symptom for these patients. If the pain is non-cardiac, we would treat as per the WHO ladder. So, you know, start with paracetamol and work your way up um, towards opioids and adjuvants. If the patient has angina pain, then usually it's best controlled with anti-anginal medication. But however, if the angina pain is refractory and it's just not, not shifting, then it's worth trying a modified release opioid for these patients because it can be really helpful. And again, I talked about it already. It's a, a pet subject of mine. These patients are at huge risk of becoming constipated because they have reduced mobility because of their breathlessness and fatigue. They have restricted fluid often because of their um, fluid overload. They have poor food intake, either because they are not able to prepare it or because the reason maybe that they've got heart failure is because um, of lifestyle factors that mean maybe they don't have enough uh, fiber intake. Uh, diuresis, of course, can cause constipation, and so can the opioids. So we would normally recommend using a stimulant such as Senna, plus or minus a softener, and tailoring it to the consistency of the stool. And if we can reduce anticholinergic and other constipating drugs, then definitely try. Um, just a reminder that if a patient is on Muvicol or Laxido, so the really commonly prescribed um, oral laxatives, so the sachets mixed with fluid, 
the fluid that those sachets of powder is mixed with doesn't count towards the daily fluid allowance. So if a patient is on a fluid restriction and then they're drinking 250 mils of Muvicol liquid twice a day, then there goes half a litre of their fluid um, allowance in a day unless you explain to them that it shouldn't count and that's because the fluid in Muvicol stays within the bowel and it doesn't enter the sort of the vascular space but you have to be cautious with Muvicol and Laxido because of the salt content um, so there are other laxatives that we would use like sodium docusate or sodium picosulfate not lactulose it's lactulose um, makes people windy and bloated um, most of my patients tell me it's not very effective either. I'll just talk very briefly about other symptoms. So um, anorexia and cachexia is common in advanced cardiac um, sort of heart failure, um, but there may be other causes such as oral candida, which is stopping people from eating properly, or untreated nausea because of side effects of medications, constipation, as I say, and then maybe things as simple as ill-fitting teeth. So correct the reversible. Refer to a dietitian if it's appropriate, not necessarily in the last few weeks or days of life. And then nausea can be a drug side effect. It could be due to gut edema, um, so common in these patients, or renal failure. Um, and first line antiemetic would be metoclopramide, 10 milligrams TDS. And please avoid on Dancitron. It just makes people constipated. Um, and it's only really effective for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, which is what it's licensed for. So another symptom list here, so dry mouth, obviously because of diuretics, the analgesics, the antiemetics, they can all cause dry mouth. So try saliva substitutes or chewing gum. Avoid acids like vitamin C and fruit juices. Um, a lot of patients with chronic peripheral edema are at risk of developing cellulitis, um, especially if they have comorbidities such as diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. So there you would follow obviously the local guidelines for antibiotics, but also make sure that the legs are really well moisturized and you can use menthol cream to cool them down as well. Um, if these patients have an itch, uh, it may be due to dry skin or renal failure. And again, you would want to make sure their skin is well moisturized and consider something like paroxetine or gabapentin. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, some medications can be continued once the patient is no longer swallowing. Uh, so this was a retrospective review um, of patients who were managed with subcut furosemide in the community um, and in the hospice to manage their end-stage heart failure. So they looked at 43 consecutive episodes where a continuous syringe driver containing furosemide was used in 32 different patients. The reason there's 43 episodes is obviously because some of those 32 patients um, had a syringe driver more than once. Um, 28 of these incidences, the syringe driver was used in the community to correct fluid balance and avoid hospital admission. Because if you remember, furosemide um, eventually it's not absorbed so easily from the gut, especially if the gut is edematous, but giving it parentally bypasses that. And 26 out of 28 patients, so 93%, avoided hospital admission because the syringe driver was used in, a in the community rather than admitting them. And 20 of them out of 28 actually lost weight. So they were obviously getting their fluid offloaded. And then 15 of the episodes were for symptom relief when a patient was dying. So these were sort of the classic bubbly, breathless, pulmonary edematous heart failure patients. And actually the symptoms of breathlessness were controlled in all 15 episodes. And the daily dose of furosemide ranged from 40 milligrams over a 24 hour syringe driver to 250 milligrams. And when you're looking at a patient's oral furosemide and converting it to subcut, the ratio is one to one. This is another list of symptoms, and this is the symptoms that a patient in the last days of life with heart failure might experience. So you can see again, there's breathlessness, fatigue, pain, nausea, anxiety, depression, confusion. These are really bread and butter palliative care symptoms, aren't they? And actually the heart failure patients had an average of 6.7 symptoms per patient. And you compare that to cancer patients, they had on average three symptoms per patient. So these patients really need us in the last days of life. And we don't treat them any differently to patients with other illnesses. 
I'm just going to quickly run through a little bit about implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Um, the reason being that when patients with heart failure who have these in, um, implanted into their, their chest wall, um, when they're coming to the end of their life, um, there comes a time when they may not want their life prolonged potentially by a defibrillator firing, or when they're actually in the act of dying, the defibrillator might fire and it might not save their life, but it will just give them an unpleasant shock. It feels like being punched in the stomach. So you can see here that ICD de deactivation in advanced disease can correct life-threatening, um, so the ICDs correct life-threatening arrhythmias and they may prolong life, but uh, there comes a time when this is no longer appropriate. And of course, defibrillation can cause dis discomfort and emotional distress. So this um, quote here is taken from the European Heart Rhythm Association saying device deactivation options should be included in the order of pre-implantation informed consent. At the time of implantation of an ICD or CRTD, the possibility that a patient's health may deteriorate to such an extent that device deactivation may be appropriate should be discussed. But I've spoken to our electrophysiologists in the card cardiology department and the amount of time they're able to spend with these patients who are about to have a device implanted um, is really short, you know, like everybody else, they're short staffed. And to have a conversation with a patient to say, I'm about to give you a life saving device, but at some point in the future, you may want it turned off. That conversation needs time to build up enough rapport for someone to feel confident having that discussion. So I can completely understand why patients may um, reach the end of their life without having talked about having their ICD deactivated. So you may see them presenting to their GP to talk about it, or they may be admitted to a hospice with a device still active. And there's a study um, in 2014 which showed that 85% of patients with an ICD, with an implant implantable defibrillator, believes that if it was reprogrammed, it meant that their heart would stop. So you can see why there's a, a lot of unease about patients if you want to raise the question of deprogramming their ICD. But it can, of course, be reprogrammed to either pacing mode only, where it would just do the standard pacemaker function, or just let it just sit there, but the heart would do its own thing still. It's done in the hospital. Unfortunately, there's no provision at the moment for the cardiac physiologist to come out to the community to deactivate them. Um, but it, uh, in other areas, it can be done with the support of a GP or a district nurse or support of palliative care. Sometimes in the hospice, we have a, um, a scenario where a patient is actively dying and the defibrillator is firing. And in that circumstance, we use a magnet, which we have to tape over their chest. And the magnet sort of stops the firing of the pacemaker. However, it's quite a heavy magnet. It has to be taped there. And it's not a one-time thing where you put the magnet on and take it off again. It has to stay there until the patient has died and the um, implant has been deactivated. So we had a patient a year or so ago in the hospice who had one of these taped over her chest for a couple of weeks and she ended up developing a pressure sore um, over her chest wall there. I haven't got my video on um, so I can see it so I hope I'm pointing somewhere <laughs> where people can see. Um, anyway so yes the magnets are um, temporary and the patient needs to go to the hospital to have it deactivated either before if it's planned or after death if not. So you'll be glad to know I've reached the summary slide and I think the really important points are that Heart failure causes a high burden of distressing symptoms and early palliative care involvement is really beneficial in terms of symptom control, advanced care planning and psychological support. I would always advise continuing the optimal medical treatment as long as possible and assess symptoms holistically without just fo functioning on one system. Make sure we open, ask open questions about how the patient is feeling. If we can reverse the reversible and the rest we should palliate. Um, so I'm going to open up for questions now. If I stop sharing or um, open the chat function, if we stop sharing, there we go. Um, so feel free to type some questions into the chat box if you have any. And just while I wait, I'm going to go back to the sharing screen and the reason for that is that um, this was too late. Oh. 
and stuff in the beginning, do I? Um, <laughs> cheeky reasons. So the reasons um, um, while you're hopefully typing in some questions. I really hope you have enjoyed tonight's talk. Um, obviously, it's been a free talk and we love to give out free education. Um, but I'm sure you're also aware that hospice fundraising has really been affected by COVID. As you saw in the hospice video at the beginning of the presentation, it costs £5 million per year to run our inpatient, outpatient, day centre um, and hospice at home services. And the vast majority of that is from fundraising. We don't get very much from the NHS at all. So we've had our charity shops closed during two lockdowns now. And of course, our big events like marathons and other events have had to be cancelled this year. So if you have enjoyed tonight's presentation or you're a believer in what the hospice does, please do think about donating to the hospice, whether it's time or um, spreading the word about our services or a bit of money if you can spare some. Um, the link to donate online is, is up on the screen at the moment. Um, thank you very much. All right, so let's stop the share again. Um, and no questions just yet, which I'm going to take as a good sign. Oh, sorry, Catherine was asked, uh, can we have access to the slides afterwards so we can look up references? And I'm getting a nod from, um, from Jenny there in education. So yes, you're very welcome to my slides. And I believe Mary has, has said previously that she's happy to share. Um, so please let us know, Mary, if that's, if that's okay with you as well. Yeah, Ros, can I just say that we will send the slides out afterwards, um, but what we will do before very cheekily is send you out a link to an evaluation, please, and we would love your feedback on today's session. Uh, once we have your feedback um, returned to us, then we will send out the slides and um, a certificate for your portfolios as well. So make sure everything's named. I'm happy for my slides to be shared. Wow. Thank you so much, Mary. Mm -hmm. And if anybody has thought of any more questions for Mary, um, I'm sure she'd still be happy to answer. Okay. Um, but I appreciate yeah. you've been listening for a long time, everybody, and um, you're probably really ready for that second glass of wine or to head to your, to your bed, whichever you prefer. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I'd like to say a really big thank you to Mary for sparing the time as well. You've been a great supporter of the hospice over the last few years. And thank you also to my lovely education team who've stayed on late. Um, you ride back up and support and um can stand it without you um and thank you everybody for listening this sounds like a, a big thank you for the team but uh, yeah and thank you very much to yourself and to you again dr mary lynch for um providing a very interesting and informative evening um and thank you to you both for giving up your time this evening not can I problem. just mention that um, Roz and her team have improved our management for our end of life patients with heart failure enormously um, over the last few years since we've been closely involved with you. So I say thank you um, oh. to, to you at the hospice for um, helping us manage our patients better. That's so lovely to hear. Thank you, Mary. And likewise, I've learned such a lot from your team as well. It's been a great collaboration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, and um, good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>